good morning, saints. Good to see you here. And uh, the word does say wherever there are two or three of us gathered in his name, there he is also. So there's at least three of us on the platform. We're good. We're good. Those of you who are joining us from across the internet, good morning. Welcome. Welcome from Thanksgiving to Advent. Yes, it is now the Christmas season and, uh, and Christmas songs are officially kosher for us to be doing. So it, it, you can expect that one of those will probably show up at some point this morning. And I, I don't know whether or not you had the, uh, like the family Zoom meeting for Thanksgiving this year. Some of us did. It was a little interesting. You know, it's kind of a weird year for things. But, but the idea of Thanksgiving is something that we can carry all year long. There's a pastor that I like. He, he says Thanksgiving was never meant to be shut up inside just one day. It's, it's something we carry with us. So as the word says, when we go to worship, we, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So let's do that this morning as we seek him and thank him for his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. So Jesus, we seek you. We uh, long to be in your presence. We're looking forward to spending time with you today. Would you make yourself known as we sing and seek you in the word and in prayer and in fellowship. We love you, Jesus. Amen. It's the only thing 
your face come and make your throne upon our praise
We thank you for your mercy. For your grace. For your goodness. Your loving kindness. doesn't ring out in all of our hearts we have known him as a father because he's revealed himself through his word through his loving kindness through his mercy through his grace through his provision through his presence he is the friend that sticks closer than a brother he never leaves us never forsakes us through his love we've known the goodness of God known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. Yes, Lord, you are faithful. Oh, my. running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness 
Jesus is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down. the goodness of God. I'll sing of your goodness, Lord. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of your goodness. I will sing of the goodness of God. Lord, thank you for running after us the ones who are lost, the ones who are faithless, Lord, and you saved us. Lord, thank you for adopting us and bringing us into your family. God, help us walk in, in the newness of that. Maybe we be reflections of you to other people, God, that see us and, and know us, that they would see the change, they would see the difference and know that it's only by an act of the God that we are the who we are now. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? I feel like we don't get that moment in the mornings. All right. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I like your shirt. <laughs> Sherwood picked it out. Oh, <laughs> perfect. So I, I am not sure what uh, Sherwood got to have a great time off with his, his family during Thanksgiving and uh, time to just kind of refresh and get renewed there. Uh, so my name is Dustin and I'm here on the, the ministry team if you don't know me. A few things coming up. So the... the Men's prayer breakfast will be this Saturday at 8 a.m. down in the fellowship hall. It'll be great food and fellowship. We talked to a kid who um, is 18, graduated this last year from high school. And when we said, hey, it's at 8 o'clock, he looked at us like we were asking him to. I don't even know what he was thinking. But he was like, uh, me, yeah. Like he didn't want to give that hard Yes to get here at 8. So we'll be down the hill at 8 a.m. on Saturday. So you guys just got, got done with Thanksgiving, right? That was this last weekend, or this last week. It was good, right? You get together and you just gorge yourself in unhealthy food and it's rich and then you take a nap and you have a second batch because that's what we do. It's what we do. You know, Beth and I, we just celebrated 12 years of marriage bliss. 
and uh, and thank you, thank you, in um, October. And, you know, when we first got married, I believe it was we were first got married, she came out to Colorado, where I'm from, for a Christmas get-together, right? So we we get there, and we're like, everybody's coming over at 4.30, and then everybody leaves at like 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, and she goes, that's it? And I go, yeah, that's it. We just saw him a month ago at Thanksgiving, and then you'll see him again at Easter, and that's all you need, right? It's, we don't like each other that much. We just put up with each other for maybe three hours on a good holiday, but two on a bad one. And she was like, oh, that, that's not very long. And so the first one that we spent with her family was like, hey, we have to be there at 7 a.m., and I'm like, oh, this, we're getting busy. I, I thought we were maybe making tamales or something like that because they'll do that. And, and we get there, and she comes from a large Hispanic family. So we get there at 7 a.m., and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to take on whatever it is that we have to take on. And she's like, no, this is, we just get here at 7 a.m. or something like that. And I'm like, that's not very godly to get, be up this early at somebody's house. And uh, she, we're, she's like, we're going to eat it too, too sharp. Right, so I'm like, I obviously like to eat, so okay, I, I can make it till 2. You know, and it's 10, 11, 1, 2 comes, there's no food. 3 comes, 4 comes, I see the kids running around, and I'm like, I could chew on one of those right now. That should suffice. And then we finally eat at like 5, and I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm starving. Right, and, and, and so we eat finally, and then we do the gifts, and then it's like, oh, we stay overnight. And I'm like, we do what? We've been here for like 27 hours already. We got another day to go. And it was just this long thing that we did together. And it was kind of different for me to, to be a part of something that it was just so long and everybody was together and you just kind of live that life. And that's what the Christian community is marked with, is that we would have joy, unity, and peace with one another as one body of Christ. So that, that people would look from the outside and recognize that, okay, it's not just a two-hour thing every week that we do, but it's a life that we live together. So that we, they would see that joy and that unity and that peace being marks of the Christian community. You know, so as we turn to Psalm chapter 22 today, which will be our, our text for the day, this, this kind of marks that, that idea of, of being together, uh, of being in unity. The Psalm 122 is a part of the Psalms of Ascent, which was meant for the, the people of Israel as they were going up the stairs to the temple for Passover after the exile. This is one of the Psalms that they would sing together. And it was written by David probably during the time of the return of the ark. So the return of the ark happens. The, the Philistines are, take over the land. or do, They don't take over the land. They, they go to battle and they get the ark of the covenant, which is God's presence in Israel. And they take it back to their temple and put it in their temple of Dagon, one of their gods. And in the morning, the statue had fallen over, the head busted off. So they're like, he just... He was a little woozy last night, so they stood him back up, and then the next day he shattered. And so they're like, it's this Ark of the Covenant, and they send it back to Israel on a cart, and as they bring it into Jerusalem, King David is dancing before the Lord. And he is so excited about it. Um, he is in what we call at our house, he was in his chonies. And he's just undignified before the Lord, just so excited that the presence of God was coming back to Jerusalem, to coming back to the people. And, and this psalm would play a very encouraging role during the time of the exiles returning to the land. So if we look at that, and we know Israel's history in 720 BC, the people of Israel were taken into exile by Assyria. And the southern tribe of Judah made it about another 150 years. But then they were exiled to Babylon in 586 B.C. And then 70 years later, they were able to return to the land. And so for them, this was like, oh my gosh, we get to go back to the presence of God. We get to go back up the temple steps. 
And there's this joy of returning home. So as we see that the Christian community is marked by joy, unity, and peace, we'll see that through seeing that we should have joy in the community and that there is a bond of unity within the community of believers and there is peace in the community. So let's open this up, Psalm 122, starting in verse 1. David writes, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. So it's this, this kind of party going up to saying, let us, let's go to the house of the Lord. And if, if we look back to, to Psalm 120 and Psalm 121, this is kind of a natural progression of the songs of ascent. Because Psalm 120, David is writing like, deliver me, God help me get out of this. And he's like, what am I going to do? And then Psalm 121, he writes, my help comes from the Lord. It's not something I can do or something maybe somebody else around me can do, but my help is from the Lord. So as, as he saw that God delivered him, that God is his help, he said, okay, let us go to the house of the Lord because where else would I rather be than in the presence of the Lord and with family? He said, let's go up there. Let's come together and ascend these steps to the presence of the Lord. So we see that first, that as, as we should have joy in the community, first we have to see what is our source of joy. And our source of joy is not on our external circumstances, but is in, on an internal relationship that we have with Christ. Right? So we find joy in God. And if we are to turn back to Psalm 16, we don't have to go there, but Psalm 16, 11, the author writes, you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So the psalmist recognized that the only way I'm going to be filled with any sort of joy is through the presence of God. That it's not well, my life is going well now. I've got a great house on the hill. I'm making a kajillion dollars a year. I've got an awesome car. But it's just through the presence of the Lord. And author and pastor John Piper in a few of his books has some great quotes in, of, of finding God and, and having him be your joy. He, he writes this, he writes, God is an infinitely glorifying, all-satisfying satisfying God, offering us everlasting and supreme joy in himself and who he is. It's not on what God gives us, but on him, that relationship that we have with him, that he is all-satisfying. In his book called Desiring God, Piper writes, God is most glorified in us, when we are most satisfied in him. So you want to give glory to God, it's not necessarily the song you sing, but simply being satisfied in him and saying, man, I, am, I can do whatever it takes because of who God is. Because I have this relationship with him that I'm finding my joy in him. Does it mean that we don't have valleys? I, no. There's, there, life is does this, doesn't it? In my almost 38 years, I've seen that. But we still say God is good. We still say, okay, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him, that he fills my joy. And so we, we have to see first that as joy is a mark of the Christian community, it's based on him, on, on who we are unified with, and that being God. You know, it's the idea of that we get to be with him and we have him in our daily lives. There was one summer that we went to camp. We went to Hume Lake for high school camp. And this one year, I got to take my family. So Mabel was about three. She was just over three, and Phineas was about five or six months old. And Hume Lake to me, is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I don't like the outdoors. I think everywhere should be city, personally. We, there was a 
gigantic baby snake outside this last week that I screamed at and had thoughts of tossing a brick five feet and just texting Pastor Todd and being like, there's a dead snake, it's under a brick. That's about as close as I could get. I just don't do outdoors well. I'm allergic to things. I can't breathe. There's not a coffee shop right there that I need. But Hume Lake to me is, is very beautiful. It's got like that picture view, that perfect picture view across the lake. And this one year that we got to take the kids, they always, every night they have kind of an intro video for the night. And this, this one year they were talking about, really about the redemption that we have through Christ and the sacrifice he made on the cross. And so in this video, the characters all had this tattoo that was a mark of their sin. And then in comes this character who, repre- who is Jesus, if you will. And they've all got this tattoo that represents their sin. And like every new parent, you realize every day that you are learning. And so I'm letting Mabel watch this video every night. And then it comes to the night where he's, he's going to be killed. And so they're, they're beating him up. And as they're hitting him, all the... the kind of their, their tattoos are sort of going on him, if you will, and he's getting covered in them. And then I'm like, oh, don't watch that. Look at Daddy. I'm fun too to watch, trying to get her view to me instead of to him. And then out of nowhere, she turns at that terrible, perfect moment, and the character that you would not expect comes and stabs Jesus, and he dies, and I'm like, I just broke my three-year-old. I have no idea how we're going to reconcile this one tonight. And she starts crying, so I'm like, I got to go. And I take her outside. I always took younger leaders with me, so we didn't leave the kids, but we had them, them in there. And so she's outside. She's kind of playing, and she's beating a stump with a stick because that's what you do in the outdoors. And then she's hitting the stump, and then she goes, Daddy, they killed, or they, they were hurting Jesus. I said, yeah, they were. And she goes, they, they killed him. And I'm like, yeah, they did. And I said, but he didn't stay dead. And she's like, okay. I go, he rose again so we could have life with him, and he paid our price. Isn't that nice? And she's like, yeah. And then she goes back to beating the stump with the stick, and I'm like, okay, we're getting out the aggression better now than the therapy I'm going to have to put her in later for this movie. And she's beating that. And then she goes, daddy. Or she called me daddy Oh. She called me daddy at that time. She didn't, she didn't go, daddy can I go be with Jesus now? And I was like, not before me. But it's that idea, that childlike idea that says, you're my dad, I love you, but I would rather be in the presence of the Lord unashamed. Now, I know there's going to be ups and downs in life, but just kind of that pure motive, that pure thought that said, man, I would have so much joy in the presence of the Lord. That regardless of the circumstance, man, Daddy, you're, you're cool. I got this neat little brother that just lays there. But to be in the presence of the Lord, and that's where our ultimate joy is going to be found. Life is always going to, we have no idea what we're going to do this afternoon. We have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. So when we go and we just look at the presence of God and say, man, who you are is enough. That Jesus is enough. And we see that ultimate satisfaction is found in him. So we find joy in God. We, we actually mean what we pray. We actually live out what we say we believe. And if we neglect spiritual growth and community and make church something we only do on Sundays, joy is really not going to be there. As we see that joy is first in the Lord, we see it's also in the community of believers. When when David writes, let us go to the house of the Lord, he's not saying, oh, I'm going to go up by myself and have my own little prayer time. Where that's important, he says, no, 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 we are a community and I have joy with my brothers and sisters that we get to go in this together. Right? We We all have different stories to tell and yet God unifies us together. He brings us on this journey together. We rejoice with those who are in this with us. 
So if we see that joy is in this community as well, we see this in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. When, when Luke, the physician, writes, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the, the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. And every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Right? It it was just this joyous time together that I just like being with you. You have people like, like, just, I enjoy this moment. My ultimate joy is in the Lord, but just being together with Christian believers, I just, it fills me up. Do you ever leave those conversations like that? But sometimes we look more to the negative of people instead of the positive. And we're to look to what we have in common. You know, it's kind of like balancing a bat or balancing a broom. If you've grown up, have you ever done that? You kind of you try to balance that bat up on your hand. Do you look straight at other people when you're doing that, or do you look up? You know, when you balance that bat, you're, you're usually looking up. So you're not looking straight at the, the negative aspects of, or, or things of other people, but you're looking up to the Lord and saying, my eyes are on you, my joy is in you. I'm going to have joy in the community, and we're going to do this together. There might be things in other individuals that you might not like, you might not care for, but that doesn't mean you don't find joy in the community of believers. Because the Christian community is marked by joy, unity, and peace. So as we, we, we see that, we see that it's not just we find joy in God, we find joy in each other. Then we see that there's a bond of unity in this community that brings us together. So as we look at verse 3, David continues, Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. So it's a city that is firmly together, the CSB, reads that Jerusalem built as a city should be solidly united. So ancient Israel was very much like maybe San Diego is now or the Bay Area, right? It's not going out, it's just going up because everybody's stacked on one another, right? They were all within the walls, they were all within this small area and they were just linked together. They were united together, right? They weren't, it wasn't like, okay, you're, you're East County, you're a little weird. Uh, we're the beach culture, we're normal. But it was all together. It was all together. And as you see, he says that the tribes go up. He doesn't say, hey, we're all the same. He's like, we're all different and we're going to the same area, we're going to the same place to worship the Lord together. That it's not uniformity. It's not like, okay, we only wear Levi's. And plaid shirts, right? I find that to be comfortable, and that's what I wear almost every single day. But we're not all expected to be exact, but it's recognizing we're all tribes, where we all come from different areas, going to the same place. You know, and and unity, and I'm not talking about universalism, but I have some very good charismatic friends, right? I have a mentor who's, who's more charismatic or more Pentecostal than I am. I'm pretty Southern Baptist in my doctrine and theology and am okay with that. But it doesn't negate the relationship that we have together. Right? He'll be like, I'm going to speak something into your, your life, Estelle, and I'm all going to do your thing. And, and we have just this neat relationship together and we focus on what we have 
common instead of the secondary or tertiary level ideas that might be separating us. And it's not in the idea that one's even prosperity gospel or any of those, but we're focusing on who's, who we are in Christ. And when we get to heaven, he'll see I was right and he was wrong, and it's okay. I'm okay with that. He might not be, but I'll, I'll be fine. But it's finding that joy in the community. It's, it's seeing that there's this bond of unity sitting around this verse 4. Unity is seen in the Old Testament as well in, in Nehemiah. So as, as Jerusalem is, or as Judah is coming back into the land in the early or later 500 BC, Zerubbabel brings a group back. Ezra the priest brings a group back. And Nehemiah brings a group back. And Nehemiah, he is so distraught over the, how the walls are. The walls are in rubble. There's no protection for God's people. And he... The Lord uses him to unify the people around a common purpose, and that's to build the wall. So one day, one neighbor stands guard and stands in the gap while the other one builds. And then the next day, the other, they switch. And it's unified, working towards a common goal. And we as Christians, we have that goal to see people come to Christ. And if we're not unified, much more can be done if we do it together. And we see this throughout the New Testament. James, the brother of Jesus, writes this in, in his epistle, James 4, 11 through 12. He writes, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and one judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So he's saying you're, you're not in the place of judge or lawgiver. You're together in it. Who are you to judge? Be unified. Be together. I, the book of James is one of my favorites. Even though Martin Luther, the, the reformer, called it an epistle of straw. But why? Because he, he contrasts, there's this saved, kind of saved poor people in the church and then rich, not saved, who are acting like it and giving people places of honor. And he has all these like just jabs where he says, but who are you to judge your neighbor? We don't stand in the place of judge. We are unified. We have this bond of unity. As soon as we elevate ourselves in a spot that says, I can now judge you, we've neglected the unity instead of just trying to come alongside with one another. James and his, or Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 20 through 23, Jesus says this, My prayer is not for them alone, speaking to the apostles or his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. In the Greek, that's us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So there's this kind of external aspect where the, he's saying, hey, when, when Christians walk in unity, other people see it. And then know the message that we carry is true. He's saying, hey, help them. Help them be in complete unity. Why? So that the world will see that you sent me. There's this kind of evangelistic idea of us being unified. And then the Apostle Paul adds in Ephesians 4, 2 through 6, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. 
So being brought together, being humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another, being unified. Because as soon as we again take that spot of judge or lawgiver, we neglect this. There's no spirit through the bond of peace. We're just kind of doing our own thing and pushing our own agenda forward. And there's two things that kind of upset the unity in the community, and one of them is our own sin. There are sin of pride. And as soon as we say, well, you did this, and you were this, we neglect the three fingers that are pointing back to us. And so our sin of pride or whatever it is steps us in there. The second is, is the enemy, is Satan. And my boy Charles Spurgeon, who died in the 1890s, who just, we all need to read more of Spurgeon. I feel like we'd be more holy. Just kidding. Says this, Charles Spurgeon writes, Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. He attaches far more importance to godly intercourse than we do. Since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. Right, that the idea that God, that godly people would be together, right? Spurgeon died in about 1895. So that godly people would be together, unified under the belief, Satan will do whatever he can to sear that, to break that apart. And, and, and I just appreciate the point that he brings up that, that Satan gives way more importance to kind of godly interaction than we do. Because we can almost have like this idea of, okay, be blessed. See you next week. With no follow-up or no community, we're just kind of people at a country club that come to dinner once a week. But look at when you meet those other believers in that bond of unity that you have. When I got to do a lot of missions and things like that, we, we would go to these different mission trips, these short-term trips, and it would be like Mazatlan or a place called Michoacan or the Dominican Republic. But sometimes it just felt like you were in this, okay, today's schedule is, is feeding those orphans, and today's schedule is painting this church wall that was painted last week by the previous group. And it just kind of felt like you were in this just programmed place of non-ministering, but just going to other countries to feel good about yourself and buy souvenirs. And then we did this trip to Guatemala. And there was these uh, missionaries named Matt and Brooke. And it just by the end of it, you felt like they were just a part of your family. And, and as we, we said goodbye, um, we kind of brought their kids into our group. So we, you know, as missionaries, it's not like they had a, a lot of income, but we were able to take them like zip lining and do some of those fun things that they just never got to do before. Um, I got to give them candy when they weren't allowed to have it. And by the end, it was just kind of that tear, the tears of like, okay, this is goodbye. And it was like, there was this joy of being together, this bond of unity that brings us together because of we're in this, this together. Because the Christian community is marked by joy and unity and peace. So if it's just like, okay, see on our next trip, when I get to fly down to Guatemala, we've missed it. But we see that we are unified in our common goal of making Christ known, regardless of, of people that we're ministering to, but we are in it together. We are living it together. And it, though it was sad to see each other go, it was, man, there's a certain bond. And recognizing that that unity is part of the Christian community. So if we look at really what separates the church, it's sin. It's Satan. I, I oftentimes think it, I think we sometimes, this is a, give Satan a little too much power. It's our own sin nature that gets in the way. He's just like, watch him go. They're going to mess it up anyways. But strive for unity. Don't get stuck on the small issues. Look to glorify God and edify the saints. Look for commonality. 
Look for the goodness of God and preach Christ. Right? It's not just Quest Church that's saving people. Jesus is. We just get to play a part because we have, we're a part of the ministry of reconciliation and ambassadors for Christ. So we preach Christ. We are common in our, we are unified in our goals. And then we see that they, we have this peace among us and peace within the body. And looking at Psalm 122, verse 6, David continues, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray they may be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So as we look at that, peace is, peace is written three times that we would pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Peace within the walls and peace to family and friends. Because again, the, the Christian community is first marked with joy, unity, and peace. <clears throat> So as we pray for the peace of the church and within the walls, we look at those tribes, we look at the different people, and we pray for them. We lean in and we say, hey, how are you doing? Let me pray for you now. Right? Because we as Southern Californians have this great, I think we have well, good intentions and poor follow through. Where it's like, my friends from other states and I will joke about this. It's like, hey, let's get together. Okay, yeah. With no intention of ever... Maybe there's intention of getting together or being unified or saying, hey, how can I pray for you? Okay, I'll be praying for that. Bye. But instead of saying, let me pray for you now. How can I keep that up? Maybe keeping a prayer journal, whatever it takes for you to continue to pray for others and praying for the peace of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Right, as we look at culture today, there are so many unknowns. It feels like. I mean, a year ago, who would have thought we were going to be wearing masks? I'm a little bit of a germaphobe, so I'm kind of okay with it right now. But who would have ever thought we would be wearing masks and being told that we, we have to spread our chairs out and staying six feet apart because there's cooties everywhere? We, we, we had no idea. And so what has that brought? A loss of jobs praying for others, looking to help others and saying, man, how can I help you? Looking at suicide rates skyrocketing and domestic abuse skyrocketing and child abuse and drug abuse and alcohol abuse. All rising because at some point we're just so pent up. We don't find our... It's like looking to who gives us joy, being in that community... And having peace, and some of that's been shattered. So we, as a church, have to be doing whatever we possibly can to walk life with other people. May it be a FaceTime call or a Zoom meeting with others that we just get to see one another and check in with one another. But having those peace, and as the Apostle Paul writes this in Philippians 4, Four through seven, which Philippians is it's another one, a good book. It's almost like a four-chapter thank you card to this church. And Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, because the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So as Christians, being marked with joy, unity, and peace, we see that the author of all that is God. Right? Who, who's going to give us ultimate joy? It's the Lord. He's going to be the one unifying us. He's the one who bought us and brought us together. And he's also the one that gives a peace that transcends all understanding. So considering that the Christian community is marked with joy, unity, and peace, we have to have that relationship with the Lord. 
right? What, take people to lunch. Learn about your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think this is one of the greatest uh, parts of the culture at Quest Church. There's no perfect church. We, ha- we all have growing places and things. But when Beth and I came here, it was kind of one of those we left leaving. And we kind of said, like, we were in the car. And I was like, I feel like people actually like us there. Like, we just came out of kind of a bad church experience. And I was like, I legitimately kind of just think people might like us. And that's just it. It's really a weird feeling. To come out of a place and think like, oh, I'm liked at church. But we continue that because there's broken people. And we have to be unified in our direction in preaching Christ. Because all believers play a very vital role in the community of believers. That joy, unity, and peace are marks of the corporate church as well as individual believers. So as we go out today... May our joy be found in the Lord and we be unified and have peace through him. Because you're never dismissed from church. You're sent from church to be the church. To go minister to those who don't know you or don't know Christ. So let's pray. So Father, I pray that we would be marked with joy, unity, and peace. God, I pray that we'd be watchful of the enemy and watchful of our sin, that you'd be helping us walk in the newness of life. Thank you for what your son did on the cross and and which makes all of this possible, that we could have a right relationship with you. That it's first and foremost Christ. And it... Help us make him known. And if we do not have that relationship with you, I pray that today would be the day. God, you're not lost. We're not looking for you. We are lost. And you saved us. Even when we were dead in our sins and trespasses. So God, we thank you for forgiveness. God, help us have joy in you. Let's be unified and have peace. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I told you all the Christmas song was coming, right? We're officially in Advent. And as we've received the challenge from the word to be a part of that work, letting people see the light of the gospel. I just pray that this song helps us set our hearts and minds and spirit in the right place as we are sent out to be part of that redeeming work that Jesus is doing. In darkness bound What soul could see the light of heaven's victory? No royal throne, no golden crown. In swaddling clothes, our hope was found.
us. He is born a son, the King of kings, our Savior. Come, oh, come, my Lord, on bended knee, the Christ whose name the angels sing. Now unto us is born a Son, the King of kings, our Savior. bless you saints have a blessed blessed day we'll see you next time if you have been tuning in with us online thank you those of you that have been sharing your prayer requests we will be praying with you and for you and uh, god bless you